and strews all his steps with duties as with traps. It is not indifferent to him, to this fanatic, it's not indifferent to him whether I eat meat or fish, drink beer or wine, supposing that both agree to me. Fanatical virtue is a concern with petty details, which, were it admitted into the doctrine of virtue, would turn the government of virtue into tyranny. Government of virtue does not require all of us to be exactly the same, does not prevent us from making our own choices when they're permissible. Questions about that? Okay, so let's wrap up part one. Um, Kant thinks that um, common sense morality is a pretty good guide here in the practical domain, unlike theoretical reason, which, as I explained to you, falls into contradiction, falls into antinomies, and he explores these in the critique of pure reason. Of course, one of those contradictions that theoretical reason falls into, um, the third antinomy, has to do with freedom and determination. It's very relevant to the discussion here. Um, and we'll come back to that later. But the point is that our untrained, unphilosophical reflection on morality is a pretty good guide to what morality requires. In fact, um, while trained philosophers may be better at explaining and resolving the antinomies of theoretical reason, like the existence of God, um, or um, uh, the immortality of the soul, for example. Um, trained philosophers are no better than anyone else at determining the content of our theory, what morality says. Anybody with a conscience context knows this. And in fact, philosophers have a tendency to get all, all confused uh, by introducing all kinds of irrelevancies. Um, and part of the problem here Part of the reason philosophers get confused about morality is because there really do seem to be two different competing principles here. The idea of um, the principle of duty and the principle of happiness. And so sometimes when we reflect philosophical on morality, we um, see that these are potentially competing um, principles. Um, and so we do need a way of resolving this kind of um, conflict, or sorting this out. Um, so we do need to think about how reason gets applied practically. And that's what a critique of practical reason is supposed to do. Um, and so that's what we're moving into in uh, the second into section two. Okay, so um, to recap, in part one, the first section, we are starting with our ordinary understanding, common sense understanding of morality, and moving toward analyzing it to move toward the supreme principle of morality. Um, in section two, the second section now, we're going to work from a more philosophically adequate account of a will um, and analyze that to reach the same place, namely the supreme principle of morality. Okay. Any last questions before we move on? Okay. Uh, well, 21 Kant starts by noting that. Um, the examples we've been talking about so far, um, strictly speaking, have not been drawn from experience. Rather, he says, if we attend to our experience of the behavior of human beings, we meet frequent and, as we ourselves can see, just complaints 
that no reliable example can be cited of the disposition to act from pure duty. Uh, that though much may be done that conforms with what duty requires, still it is always doubtful whether it is actually done from duty and thus has moral worth. Um, so we can never be sure, in other words, whether a person has acted from duty or merely in conformity with duty. Um, now, for Kant, this is clearly an epistemic problem. It's a problem of how we get knowledge of the true grounds on which someone acts. He's not denying that there might be such acts. He's not denying that there might be actually virtuous person, people. He's just pointing out that we can never know for sure whether someone has acted on proper maxims. And that's because maxims are not found in empirical, in empirical experience. We never have like a sensory impression of the principle that somebody was following when they act. We just see the outward manifestation of their actions. We see the action, the outward action. We don't see what their incentive was. We don't see how they were thinking about it as good. We don't know whether they we, we don't have an impression of whether they thought it was good in order to achieve some further end. We don't have an impression of whether they thought it was good for its own sake. And if they thought it was good for its own sake, we don't have an impression of how they were conceiving it as good for its own sake. Um, and that's why, he says, There have been philosophers in every age who have absolutely denied the actuality of this disposition to act from duty in human actions and attributed everything to a more or less refined self-love. Um, so it's because we don't have um, impressions of absolutely impossible by means of experience to make out with complete certainty even a single case in which the maxim of an action that otherwise conforms with duty did rest solely on moral grounds and on the representation of one's duty. Um, let me continue. For at times it is indeed the case that with the acutest self-examination we find nothing whatsoever besides the moral grounds of duty could have been powerful enough to move us to this or that good action and so great sacrifice. So even introspectively, when we're thinking about why we did something and we think of ourselves as acting from duty, that we did this in order to selflessly help someone else who was in need. But from the, and we don't see any other motivation that could have led us to do that. No secret hope for reward or fame or whatever. But from this, it cannot be inferred with certainty that the real determining cause of the will was not a co actually a covert impulse of self-love under the mere pretense um, of that idea of duty. So this is true even in the case of ourselves that we never know for sure what the maxim of our action was because we don't have an impression even in our own, of our own case of the maxim itself. Um, okay, well so we have talked about maxims, we have talked about examples, but think about these examples now. Like in the shopkeeper example, or in the suicide example, or in the um, person who's benevolent. All those examples. In all those examples, Kant just stipulates what the maxim was. He just tells us, imagine somebody who, act, who acted on this basis, or imagine somebody who acted 
on that basis. Um, so this is a deep point for Kant, that we never have an experience of maxims, just like we never have an experience of necessity or uh, causality. And therefore, there's a real question here whether the categorical imperative is useful in evaluating the actual behavior of people. There's a real question of whether the supreme principle of morality is useful in judging others or even judging our own past behavior. Because the supreme principle of morality requires that we know the maxim, we know the subjective principle of action. And there's always a question about whether we got that right. We don't have an impression, we never have an empirical impression on this. So the supreme principle of morality here that we've been talking about doesn't seem especially well suited to making, let's say, retrospective evaluations of somebody's conduct even our own. If we're given a maxim, or if we stipulate what a maxim is, then we can try to decide whether it's permissible or not, whether maybe it's required or not. We can make a, 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 a judgment or an assessment of it. Um, but it's only going to be, maybe in philosophical examples, where we stipulate, where we give an example of a maxim and then ask about it. Or in deliberation. Because that's exactly what we're doing in deliberation. In deliberation, we're taking a maxim and asking about it. So when we deliberate, we stipulate a maxim. We say, here's a maxim. Would it be OK for me to act on it? Is that maxim permissible? Um, so, in deliberation, we can specify, in detail, a maxim to consider and then ask whether that's a permissible maxim. Then we, then we have the maxim in hand, so to speak, because we're, we just specify it. And now we're, we're going to consider whether that maxim is going to be permissible or not. So, Although the supreme principle of morality is not so useful, I'm claiming, in evaluating the past actions of a person, even of ourselves, because there's always going to be doubt whether we've got the maxim right, it is going to be useful, so to speak, looking forward in deliberation as we consider one maxim or another. Because then we can say, here's a maxim, is that OK? Like giving ourselves the maxim we can determine what it's going to be. Um, is that good? So, I mean, so this is you know, two different perspectives from which we want, might want to make some kind of moral judgment. One is, so to speak, retrospectively, when the action has already occurred. And we're going to have some doubts about what that maxim was. And so we're going to have some doubts about whether the supreme principle, what, what the supreme principle of morality says about that case. Whereas looking forward, we can um, specify and then compare and deliberate over exactly the maxims that we want to think about. Because they, we, give them so, they, we give them to ourselves. So uh, the supreme principle of morality I, I suggest to you um, is something that Kant is presenting to us as useful in a deliberative context. First, however, I want to stress one last point, um, and this is something that becomes clear in some of Kant's later writings, um, and that is that although the deliberative point of view. Where I'm asking, should I ask, should I act on this maxim? Is that permissible?